All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the Seattle Angel Workshop Series. Um, we're doing this workshop series as a part of our program that we're going to do in the fall of, of running an angel conference where 50 or 60 companies will get reviewed by 40 um, angels. And in the end, one of them will get an investment. Um, but we try to build out a vocabulary among our participants. So Greg, um, you are one of the um, great leaders of our startup ecosystem. You were at uh, Madrona, you helped uh, with the Mona Madrona Labs effort, you helped the uh, Rover do a startup weekend and get up and going. And then you have this thing called Pioneer Square Labs, all of which most people probably don't know any of the details of that journey. Could you sort of introduce yourself a little bit and then dive right into the middle of your talk? Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Uh, Greg Gottesman. Um, I've been a venture in venture and startups uh, for 25 plus years, and uh, pleasure to to be here with you. Um, yeah, my background really quickly. I actually have a JD and an MBA from Harvard, so we'll actually we'll, we'll actually be using some of the JD piece of that tonight. <laughs> Um, because we're going to be talking about some legal stuff, but really from a business person's context. So um, how to think about deals and terms, uh, you know, in a way that's strategic from a business perspective, and then you always will have lawyers. But I think one of the things that stops, I know, in talking to you know, thousands and thousands of angels over the years is one of the things I think that makes some angels hesitate is a lack of familiarity is a good, uh, so, so but one of the things that I think that makes a lot of angels hesitate from making investments is a lack of familiarity with sort of the terms and, 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 and what does it mean and how do I feel a little bit more comfortable with that? So hopefully by the end of, of this talk, we can, uh, we can focus on just some of the key terms that matter and, and, make, and make folks feel a little bit more uh, educated on sort of what are the, what are the things that really sort of uh, make a difference. And that, whether you're an entrepreneur or an investor, I think that can be uh, really useful. So I wanted to try to have a very practical talk. So as John said, you know, I was one of the founders of a firm here called Madrona Venture Group. I was there for over 20 years. Um, while I was there, um, I did start this company called Rover.com. And then we, I just rang the bell on Monday at NASDAQ. That was sort of a highlight and kind of a fun, uh, a fun, uh, a fun thing for uh, a milestone for that company. Um, it actually went public a year ago, but, but because of the pandemic, we weren't able to go and, and, and do the ringing of the, of the bell. So we did it uh, this past Monday, um, or not this Monday, the Monday before this one. Um, the, um, um, I also started something called uh, Madrona Labs while I was a, a, a general partner at Madrona and then wanted to sort of scale that effort. So where I've been spending the last seven years is at Pioneer Square Labs. Uh, Pioneer Square Labs starts companies. We've spun out over 30, you know, th like 33 companies over the last handful of years, all venture-backed here in the Pacific Northwest. In fact, 10% of the venture-backed companies here in the Washington state, we actually started in this lab here. So pretty, pretty exciting. We have also multiple venture funds uh, that invest in companies that have nothing to do at all with the lab. They're just a traditional early stage venture firm. And, um, I've been teaching entrepreneurship for the last 23 years at the University of Washington. Um, and this is one of the, one of the talks of that, of the class that I've been teaching for a long time um, uh, is on, okay, how to think about term sheets. I think it's a, quite a useful, uh, hopefully a useful session. Um, I put in the, in the a chat a uh, link to a book that uh, has more details on what we'll talk about but, um, uh, and sort of if you want to delve into more details, but the goal here for tonight is just to do a really quick uh, look at sort of what are the things that really matter. So if there's not any questions, I can get right into it, but any questions before I, uh, before I start? Well, I'd, I'd sort of like to 
be a little bit pedantic and talk a little bit about um, what an investor is, what a lead investor is, and what the founder does in terms of making the offer. Because I think a lot of times people aren't quite sure how the conversation happens. Um, and so if we could lay that out a little bit, that, I think that would be useful. Sure. Let me, let, me, let me start and we can do that as a piece of this. Um, does everyone see that? Yep, except it's in not in presentation. No, you want me to do the play from start. Okay. I'm going to also include a, um, and we'll get to that in a second, a sort of an annotated term sheet. Um, so what we're going to talk today about is, is, is deals and, and, ter and, and, and term sheets. But this is about the capital piece of, uh, and financing piece of doing startups. Obviously, there's so many more important things to talk about for startups than just how do they actually raise money. But this tends to be uh, a topic a lot of people want to know more about. Um, when you're raising money, um, there's a lot of different forms that that can take. So oftentimes if you're raising seed money, um, you can raise that from friends and family. Uh, you can raise that from angel investors. You can raise that from professional investors like venture capitalists. You can raise debt um, from banks. But what we're going to talk about today is, a, is some of the, the, just the classic sort of angel and venture capital way, you know, uh, venture capital firms, the way they invest in companies. Now, before we get started, um, a classic way that a, an angel investor um, or, a, um, or a venture capitalist will invest in your company or a venture capital firm will invest in your company uh, would be through something called a, uh, a safe or a convertible note. Um, and what that means is that's basically a way to make an investment in your company um, without setting all the terms uh, up front. Now, ultimately, a safe, which is which is effectively it's a it's a it's a security agreement for future equity, basically. So, um, um, or it's not a security agreement; it's just a it's a it's a it's an agreement for future equity. Um, but it acts a lot like a convertible note. What it's going to do is it's going to ultimately turn into a broader term sheet that, and that's what we're gonna talk about more today. So whether it's a convertible note or a safe, that's a precursor and ultimately will end up in something if the company is even, you know, is successful enough to be able to keep going, will turn into something that will look more like what we're gonna discuss today, which, are, which is a term sheet for a classic seed round or a series A round or a round of financing that, that, uh, that discloses or that has more terms associated with it. Um, it used to be when I started in venture capital, people wouldn't do, 25 years ago, people wouldn't do notes or safes. Does anyone know why there was a change in a specific term that then made those become a lot more popular? Anyone want to guess why? Um, why is it that John knows, but I want to know, does anyone else have a, want to sort of um, take a gander as to why, um, why safes and convertible notes became more popular? Okay, John, we'll see, how, we'll see if you're smart enough here to get this right. Let's hear yes. what you have to say. If I'm right. So my, my expectation is that it's a function of the cap putting caps on the convertible notes that enabled people to see where the risks were in that process. Yes, score one for John. So, so there, there was an invention, some smart lawyer somewhere decided that, you know, typically if you have a convertible note, what that means is you have debt and that's going to convert into the next round of financing traditionally at a 20% discount to that round. 
So you would say, you know, the, the historically you would say, okay, I have this note and I'm gonna put in, let's say $500,000. And then when some venture capital firm or a bunch of angels get together and actually put together the round, the seed round of financing, it'll convert into that round at a 20% discount. And most sophisticated investors said, wait a second, that doesn't sound like such a good deal. You mean, I'm going to invest in you. You're basically, you know, you know, a man and a woman in a garage and you don't really have a great idea. And maybe you've got a dog that's walking around, but like, I, like, like, I'm going to get a 20% discount on this next round. I, I want more. I want, I'm taking a lot more risk. I'm going to give you all this money. And then all of a sudden you're going to go raise a bunch more money. And all I'm going to get is a 20% discount. And most people didn't like that deal. Um, and so um, someone came up with a novel idea say, okay, let's put all the terms that are going to come with a round of financing. Let's put them all aside except for one. And that's valuation. How much, you know, what's the valuation of this company? And so that's called a cap. And so then what they would say is, this is a convertible note or it's a safe. They're effectively the same thing. One has a security interest, the other doesn't, but, but let's put that aside for now. And they effectively said, I'm going to invest in your company and this, in this, agreement that's going to convert into some future round, but we're going to set the valuation right now so that I'm going to get the better of whatever that valuation is or a 20% discount. So I'm going to say like, I'm going to invest $500,000. It's going to be at a $3 million cap or a 20% discount, which means that it, either my money is going to go in at the better of $3 million pre-money valuation or a 20% discount. So if the next round is done, let's say at a $5 million valuation, let's say 12 months later, I get the benefit from taking that early risk and I'll go in at a $3 million valuation. Other people will go in at a $5 million valuation. And so that, with that term, these notes became much, much more popular and, and, even, and because they're cheaper, a lot more standard. But all of that is leading to what we're going to talk about now, which is a classic term sheet. So it's going to convert into something, right? So instead of talking about your first apartment out of college, we're going to talk about the home that you're going to buy, right? Not, not, the, not the small one bedroom that you sort of lived in while, you're, you know, while you were sort of really young. Um, we're going to say, okay, well, ultimately you wanna, you're going to want to upgrade if you sort of continue on in your life. To, uh, to an actual round of financing. And that's what we're gonna focus on. Any questions though about convertible notes or safes, you'll hear those terms thrown around a lot. And that's what they are, is essentially a piece of debt that ultimately will become equity in a future round of financing um, led by most likely sort of sophisticated angel investors or venture capital investors or something like that. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, so let's say an investor uh, is agreeing to uh, give you money and uh, um, what percentage uh, of the company he's gonna ask for, like uh, usually, like, hey, I want 1% of the company. Or uh, how, What do they ask for in return? Yeah, let us get to that in a second. I definitely will cover that, okay? But just hold for okay. one second. Okay, gotcha. so this is, how can I, can I, let's see if I can, um, does everyone see this? I'm screen sharing, but it's way to the side of my, okay, here it is. Yep. So this is a, this is what we're talking about, which is a term sheet, all right? Um, um, I will, I can share this. A term sheet is, a redacted version of about a couple hundred pages of legal BS, all right? But even the term sheet is pretty freaking hard to decipher. So this is the, this is the cliff notes for an actual round of financing, all right? Um, but this is like cliff notes for a really, really 
difficult, you know, this is war and peace cliff notes. This is like, you know, um, there's all kinds of terms in here. So it's like, okay, how much are you raising? What's the pre-money valuation? The shares, um, you know, post-money valuation, you know, the rights of those shares, the, uh, there's just all kinds of terms in this. Um, I'll share this. This is an annotated version from Wilson Sonsini, which does a good job on these. But you can see there's just voting rights, protective provisions, um, you know, the board will talk about registration rights. What if you go public? Oh my goodness. Like all kinds of stuff that doesn't matter. Demand registration rights. I mean, this is why angel investors piggyback registration rights. Like this is scary, you know, registration on Form S3, I don't even know what that is. And I'm like, a, I'm an attorney, who knows what that is? Uh, you know, limits on future registration rights. I mean, just crazy stuff. And this, by the way, is the massively, massively, massively shortened version of ultimately what turns into a round of financing. And so I thought it would be interesting if we just said, okay, all this stuff, all this term sheet stuff, there's only a couple things that matter. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about the vast majority. Of, like this is like you ever saw that you know movie with Robin Williams, uh, you know Dead Poet Society, where you ripped it. Let's, let's rip this up. There's only two or three things really in this term sheet that matter, and a couple other things to think about. And that's what we're going to sort of focus on tonight. And I'll and I can show you on the term sheet where they are. But most of this stuff is boilerplate. You're not going to change it. You shouldn't spend any time on it. You want to learn more about it. I give you a reference to a book where you can learn more about it, but most of it isn't really going to matter very much. So what we're going to spend time on are the things that do matter. Um, and let me again now share, go back. I'm going to share this. And um, so can you all see this? Okay. The only five terms that matter. So, um, let me see if I can move this because basically I have the, um, you're in my, uh, okay. So deals in venture, in startups, they're really only about two things. There's only two things that any deal, whether it's the, we were talking about the bridge notes earlier before, we were talking we talk about seed rounds, series A rounds, series B rounds, all these different rounds. They're only about two things. And that is economics and control. Who gets the economics and when of a deal and who gets to control the company and how. And that's all we're gonna talk about. So every term, in these term sheets is about one of these two things. How are we gonna divide up the pie, that's economics, and who gets to decide how the, you know, how things, you know, are gonna go, and that's the control provisions. Okay, here's the question. John has already answered, so someone better be bold. I saw someone say for introverts who are trying to confident, so I may, I may cold call you if you don't raise your hand on this one. Um, which do you think people, fight about more in term sheets and which is more important? Who wants to take that? Economics or control? I which will take that, Jürgen. I will say they fight, they fight about economics, but control is more important. See, I, I, I should, maybe I should just, I'm just gonna sign off because it's not even fun. No one's like getting these, yes. Contr economics is what everyone spends 95% of the term, if the, 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 you know, uh, arguing over. And most problems and deals happen because of the control provisions. It's very interesting, even though people spend very little time focused on the control provisions. That's actually when, when, when bad things happen, that comes to really matter. We'll talk about that. So the first, the first term here, is again i'm like i'm blocked out but i think it's just say valuation is that what this says so the first term that matters is valuation and let me go and show you where that shows up on this on this term sheet here um if i can find i've got like a gazillion things open um let me see where's the 
I need to close a bunch of my documents probably here. Um, here it is, okay. Um, so let's go to, so here it is. Pre-money valuation, post-money valuation, and how much is being raised. That, that's what the valuation, this is where 90% of the argument happens. Dan, I can see your face because yeah, I don't have that many, you know, Dan's is, is, is valuation an economics term or a control term? I believe that's an economics term. It's an economics term. Okay, and so let me ask you this. So if I am investing, Dan, in your company, and I'm going to put in $3 million seed round, typical seed round these days in a venture context, okay? At a pre-money valuation of $6 million, okay? What's the post-money valuation? I believe it would be three plus six is $9 million. That's right. So three plus six, the post money, if I put in three on a $6 million valuation would be nine. How much of the company, if the investors put in $3 million, do I own? The As entrepreneur of oh, the investors would own investors. one third post money. The, the founding team, the, the remaining team would own two thirds. Correct. Does everyone get, so let me, I'm going to ask him to ask some, so, so let's see if we can do another one here. I'm investing and I'm investing $5 million. Okay. On a $20 million post money valuation. What's the pre money valuation? And can you hear me? 15. But this is Ann Millington. Oh, 15. 15. And how much do I own of the company as of the investors that put in five? Hmm. Can someone else answer? <laughs> Who wants to take that? I can take it. Jürgen, it's, it's one quarter. You've got 25%. Yeah, so how did you get that? You divided uh, five, 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 of five. five of 20. Five of 20. So you take the amount invested and you divide it by the um, post money valuation. That's how you get the percentage ownership of, a, of how much investors take. On average, a typical seed round, this would be different from an angel sort of really early sort of pre seed round is gonna take between 20 and 40% of your company. Roughly a third of the company is the way I think about it, especially if we're adding in option pools and other things like that. So one way to think about that, uh, Kelly, let's ask you this difficult question, Kelly. So if I said roughly you're raising a seed round of financing, you know you're gonna give up roughly a third of your company Okay, so if you said to someone, it's, this is a little tricky as an as a entrepreneur, if you said to someone, they may say, um, what the valuation is, you say, well, I think it'll be typical. I'm, I think I'm going to give up, you might say 20% or 25% of your company, but you know, ultimately, you're going to give up roughly a third of your company, right? And they say, well, how much are you raising? And Kelly says, I'm raising $5 million, okay? So Kelly, if you told them I'm an investor, I'm raising $5 million, in the back of my mind, I'm a smart, sophisticated investor. What am I thinking that you think the ballpark of your, of your pre-money valuation is gonna be? Does that make sense? So I just told you, it's a little bit of complicated here. I just said, you're gonna give up roughly a third of your company, that's typical ballpark, okay? It's not perfect. It's, it could be 20 to 40%-ish, right? And you just told me that, that you're raising five. In the back of my mind as an early investor, what am I thinking that you think the pre-money valuation should be? Because you're not setting it. I'm going to set it as a lead investor, as the person, the investor gets to set the valuation, not you as the entrepreneur. So, so you're raising five, 
what am I thinking as an entrepreneur, sorry, as the investor that you think the ballpark of that, that pre-money valuation will be? That's going to be a third of 5 million. So it's going to be a third. So what's the pre-money going to be? The pre-money, if I'm trying to raise 5 million, um, is going to be um, 15 million. Well, we don't know the post money. The post, money the post money is going to be 15 think, and the pre is going to be what? Thinking the pre is five, but someone says 10 million. <laughs> Yeah, the pre is going to be 10 yep. and the post is going to be 15 and I'm raising five, to, if, which means that, that the investors are going to get third of the company for that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. And that's all in here. Now there's a little bit of, you don't really want to go up against, like I've probably done, I think I've invested in over 260 companies. So I've done a lot of term sheets and this and that, and each company has, you know, multiple rounds of financing. And then I've also looked at that. So I've, I've looked at at least 10,000 term sheets, right? And there's a bunch of little funny business that you can do. One funny business you can do with valuation is you can increase the size, you can play with the size of the option pool. And what I mean by that is, so Kelly, right now you own 100% of your company, right? Okay, now you come to me, or maybe you and another founder own, you own 70, let's say your co-founder owns 30% or something like that, okay? Now you come to me and you say, I want to raise some money. And I say, I love your company. I'm going to invest $3 million, okay? Um, but I say, you know what? You own 70 and your co-founder owns 30, we're going to have to hire a lot of people over the next 18 months. So what I want to do is I want to put an option pool into the company so that after the end of the financing, it's going to be equivalent to 20%. What I just did, by the way, very typical, you should have some option pool. But depending how big I make that option pool, that can radically change the valuation. So if I say it's a $5 million value, let's say it's a $10 million valuation, but I'm forcing you to have an additional 20% options po you know, post that I'm not going to take the hit for as the investor. I'm putting all of that on your shoulders. What happens to the valuation? What have I just done effectively to the valuation? I think that makes the valuation um, go. So there's now more shares. There's a little bit of a trick It doesn't do anything to the valuation, okay. <laughs> but it does change the price per share. There we go. Right. And so the amount I'm having to pay for it effectively kind of did change it, but in terms of this term sheet, it doesn't because I, what I did is I played with an option pool. So I'm just giving you some things. I don't think we need to like, we could spend a long time going into this, but one way to think about it is, is to say, oh, you know, is to say, okay, um, someone's putting money in, there's a pre and there's a post, how much dilution am I taking in terms of the investor stuff? And then who's going to take the hit for that option pool? Am I going to take all of that myself or are the investors potentially going to share some of that? So you might come back and say, hey, I'm willing to take 10% of that hit for the options, but I'd like you to share in an additional 10% or something like that. And that's a way for you to sort of play with valuation. But anyway, one term that we've been talking about then is valuation. Okay. That's the one term that does matter. Um, let's just... Uh, 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 let's just go through this one more time again, though, and I'll ask Josh. Josh, is it, was was valuation uh, economics or control term? Technically, an economics term. One hundred percent economics term, and where it shows up is right here on this little, you know, 
how, right here. And then there's an option pool coming. There's a, there's a place in here later where it says, you know, how much of the, how, you know, how many options that will be included post. And you can sort of look at, look for that in the term sheet, by the way, almost impossible to find this stuff in the 300 pages, easier to find it on a, on a term sheet. Okay. Let's go back to number two. We've only hit number one, but hopefully we can move a little faster. Okay. Number two, um, how do I get rid of this? What does this say, Salix? Can you read the, this says liquidation yeah. preference? It says liquidation preference, okay. one plus one equals three. Does one plus one equal three, Salix? Not to my knowledge, it does not. <laughs> Sometimes in venture deals it does, but yeah, generally does. So, so um, let me ask you this, Salix. So, what is liquidation preference? When I am an investor, am I investing in common stock generally or preferred stock? Now let's go back to where liquidation preference shows up on this term sheet. It's gonna show up right, I'm gonna move this here. It's gonna show up right. Um, oh. Dividends. I guess it's preferred. Dividends, dividend. There it is, liquidation preference. Okay, so do you invest as an inv as an investor? Are you going to have preferred or common? Preferred, from what I understand. You're going to have preferred shares, and as an employee and a founder, what are you going to have, common or preferred? Common. Which would you rather have, common or preferred? Preferred. Is that just because it's preferred? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you would rather have preferred because preferred has a bunch of extra rights associated with it. One of which, and maybe the most important of which is liquidation preference. And liquidation preference means if, and you can read it here, but basically what it means is investors get their money back first. Investors get their money back first. Is that fair? So say, let's, let me ask you this. I just put $5 million into your company. Okay. You spend three years of your blood, sweat, and tears. We sell the company for $4 million. The investors own 30%. You own 70%. How much of that $4 million exit do you get? I don't think any, because you invested five. Correct. You get zero, right? Because investors get their money back first. Um, now, the way liquidation preference works is you can either have something called, and this is the vast majority of times, and as angel investors, I think this is actually the best thing, but this is now I'm going to get a little bit more complicated here. Um, you can have something called participating liquidation preference, or you can have non-participating. I would say about 85, 90% of deals are non-participating. And what that means is that investors get to choose. I can either get my money back first, or I can convert into common. So if I had a whiteboard, it'd be much more fruitful here, but I don't. But let's just do a little exercise here. So I own 30% of the company, Salix. I invested $5 million in your company. The company sells for $10 million. Okay. Would I choose to convert or would I choose to take my liquidation preference? Only one round of financing. We're making this simple. I own 30% of the company. I invested five. It sells for 10. Would I, would I, Convert into I think common, five back. or do I take my liquidation preference? Go ahead. Yeah, I think you'll, you'd want your five back. Why would you want your five back? 30% of 10 million is less than 5 million. Yes. So would you rather have $5 million or $3 million? I would rather have $5 million. Yeah, I'd have to yeah, say. That's exactly right you would take your liquidation preference because it's 
more. Okay, let's say, let's say, say like that we sold the company for $20 million. Would you non-participating preferred? Would you choose to take your money back? Or would you convert? I personally would choose to convert. Who wouldn't choose to convert? Everyone would choose to convert. Because why though? <laughs> why? Why would everyone choose to convert? Still on me? Yeah. Wait, because 30% of $20 million is more than $5 million. Correct. Okay, now, you, what participation does, we won't spend much time on it, is you, it doesn't mean you get, so we'll say something like, you get your money back and then you participate up to, up to a 3x and then you stop participating. That doesn't mean you get 3x off the top. It doesn't mean you get 2x off the top. What that means is I would get $5 million and then of the remaining, let's say it's sold for 20, of the remaining 15, I would get 33% of that until I hit, let's say it was one plus two times participating. So 3x participating, I would, I would, I would get one plus 30% up, you know, of, of that remaining 15 up until the point where I hit 3x, at which time I can then either choose to take that or convert. So it gets a, it can be a little more complicated, but let's not get into that too much because the vast majority of times it's going to be non-participating preferred. Now as an angel investor, Nick, are you going to be an angel investor? Who's an angel investor? Who wants to be an angel investor? I need to see some faces of people. Okay, Dan wants to be an angel investor. Dan, as an angel investor, do, would you like to have, there's also this thing called fully participating. Fully participating, meaning you get your money back and then you participate. So you never choose to convert unless the company goes public and then everyone gets common. But would you like to have, as an angel investor, first money in, would you like to put a little bit of structure, maybe have some participation so you can kind of get more money um, out of the deal if it was sells for a sort of a smaller amount? Or do you want to keep it clean and just have, now you're not a founder here, you are an investor. Which would you prefer? To have some kind of participation or do you want to have non-participating? Well, it's getting complex, but you said something about getting more money out. And I, as an investor, I would look for terms that allow me to get more money out on successful outcomes. Yeah, so that's what most people would say, and I think it's completely wrong. Um, but I think you, but I think you, I, but let, so who wants to get, why as an angel investor is having terms that are better for you in the case of an exit actually bad for you? Who wants to take a gander? I will take a gander. Yes. Um, because there are going to be subsequent rounds and the subsequent rounds will want the same terms or better terms. And then you basically stuck with the much bigger investor taking a huge chunk out of it. Yeah, I don't even know. Like, I, I clearly don't need to be here because like that was, like everyone answers these questions much better. Yes, uh, that is a hundred. So can you say that again so people understand? So typically... An angel investor is not the last investor. You're not the last ones. There's going to be subsequent rounds. And in my history of 270 deals, I have never seen a deal get better for the founders over time, ever. It's either the same terms or it's worse. Mostly it's the same terms. So now I put a bunch of participation on because Dan wants to. Thank you, Dan, for screwing us all over. Um, and now we put in $500,000 and Dan wants 3X participating, right? Or maybe even fully participating because he's really, he's really, uh, you know, he wants, you know, he's really thinking I'm going to get my money out. Now you could do that if you think there's only going to be one round of financing. Rarely, that doesn't happen very often. Okay. So now he does that. Now VC comes in is VC going to say, oh gosh, those angels, such nice guys. I think I'll get worse terms than them. No, they're going to say, I'll have the same exact terms. Thank you very much, Dan. 
and they're going to put in their $15 million or their $20 million or their $50 million, and they're going to have their 3X. And so you are going to get screwed because all of a sudden, <laughs> all that money is going to these other guys. And then the next round comes in the same thing, right? So you all of a sudden are putting a massive amounts of liquidation preference effectively ahead of you without doing it. So one of the things I tell angel investors is you are much, 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 much more aligned. And by the way, so is Madrona, so is PSL. We are much more aligned with the founders than we are with later stage investors. So simple terms, no participation, because most likely that's just going to be copied. It's better for the founders, better for you as an early stage investor. And yeah, don't try to play funny games with it. Okay, so that's liquidation. By the way, Dan, liquidation preference, economics term or control term? I got to speed up here. I do believe this is still an economics term as it's it has to do with let's go, who let, gets let's paid move on. how much. Dan redeemed himself in our eyes. All right. So, um, okay. So next, I think I can't. Can, can I jump in with a question? Yes. Uh, uh, you said that in 270 deals, you've never seen a deal get better for founders. I think that's too broad. You, you need to qualify it a little bit. I mean, I believe successful companies Yes, the founder might be diluted and so on, but nobody will take investments if the deals are not better in code. Well, the valuation founder. gets better, but the terms don't get better. So for example, if I said, they're not gonna let earlier investors, let's say sometimes people will say, I want my money back first and I wanna have senior liquidation preference. So in other words, let's say there's multiple rounds of financing and the next round comes in and they say, Hey, I'm going to put in three million, but I want to get it ahead of the. I want to get it ahead of the the last round of financing. So then the new investor comes in, and you know what they do? Literally, they just copy the term sheet. This is not a difficult thing, and they also will then now have senior liquidation preference on their terms. So you're right; they get better in the sense valuation will go up, but things like liquidation preference, control provisions, those things never get better. They always stay the same, most likely, or they get, you know, or sometimes they can get worse. So for example, let's say someone says it's a super high valuation and they might say, um, and I'm going to put in a hundred million dollars on a billion dollar valuation, but I'm nervous about the economy. I may say, I'm going to put a hundred million dollars, but I want that hundred million dollars first. And so the, the other 50 million that's already been put in, I want that to be behind me. So you might get worse in that way, but you, but you generally they'll just say I'll just I'll just be part of it, so I'll just have it together. Okay, let's talk about control provisions. Control provisions, by the way, or protective provisions. I'm going to ask. This is a tough question, so I'm going to ask Anne, who has her hand up. Is control provisions a control term or an economics term? I mean. If it's called control provisions, I would tend to say control, but the fact that you're asking that, maybe it's economics, I don't know. No, it's totally control. It's a totally okay, control. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why they're called control provisions, because they're, they're really important. They're also called protective provisions. They mean the same thing. And Mateo, what is a, what is a protective provision or a control provision? What does it mean? Um... Let's go to it because I know Mateo wants to see it on the term sheet, but you get to start answering before I show you. Let's see if well, we can find it. Voluntary conversion. This is the third thing. This is number three. Okay. There it is. Protective provisions. Okay. I assume, like my guess is that because it's not economics, it doesn't have to do with the uh, money involved or the valuation, but it's more about the, um, the rights, the, the power to make decisions. Um, yeah, yeah, so let's go, let's, go, let's do a typical one. Like, let's go to this, this bottom one, very typical. 
by the way, you don't just like take venture capital or, or, or serious angel money without giving up something, right? So what this says is for so long as at least X number of shares remain outstanding without the approval of a, of a holder of at least typically it's a majority of the series A preferred, it could be series C preferred, whatever. So without, without, without a majority of that class, and let's go down to number, the last one, you can't, or let's go to this one where I'm trying to find this. Yeah, no, where are you? Um, let's go to this one here where it says, affect a corporate event or other transaction that constitutes a liquidation unless basically half of the people vote for it. What does that mean? So without half of the people voting, so I only own 30% of the company, right, Mateo? Okay, but, and I, I put in, let's say I'm a majority of the round, I put in four of the five million bucks, so I own more than a majority. Without my vote, can you sell the company? Can you sell the company? Sorry, I was muted. I, I, I said, like, I guess if you put a control provision, you can't. If you're kind of blocking that or correct i'm blocking now i have a right for example and there's a bunch of other rights too but in this case i have a right to block you that's why that's why you um i have this picture and you say well wait a second mateo says i am an extremely profitable company um and i want to take a bunch of money and I want to go sail. I don't know where this is in the Bahamas. I want to distribute that money out and I want to go take a hop on a boat with my new lovely spouse and family. And I want to go, can you do that? I guess you can. Maybe. No, you can't do that. There's a whole bunch of things you can't do. Can you change the number of directors? Can you sell the company? Can you pay yourself too much? Can you take out insurance? All kinds of things that are really important. Okay you can't do without me agreeing to it, me being the investor. Is that fair? Well, I don't know if it's fair, but having put in the money in as an investor, probably you're trying to protect yourself from events like these ones, no? Correct, I'm trying to make sure that you don't just sell the company without me agreeing to it. By the way, that's also why I have preferred. So if I just had common, right? And this that has happened. Let's say I put in, I'm gonna have 30% of your company. I put in 3 million on a $10 million post, okay? And the next day you decide, someone comes and says, and it's non-participating, okay? and I might not have this term, and someone says, here's $11 million. Or let's say here's $9 million. Company's really early, you don't have squat, maybe you have a little bit of some IP and blah, 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 you get 11 million bucks. How much, how much do you take home? Well, with a 30%, I mean, if, if you have liquidation preference, you get the full 30 million. Yeah. You take right? home, let's say it was 9 million, you take home 6 million, the investors would just get their money back. If it was just common, right? So let's say I own 30% and I didn't have this liquidation preference. This is different than the control. We're going back to liquidation preference. And let's say, but let's say I don't have a liquidation preference, okay? Now, yeah. Now I'll explain to you why it makes sense. All of a sudden, someone comes to you and says, you own just 30% of the company, right? You put in $3 million, the company sells for $5 million. What do you get if you don't have the liquidation preference? You get $1.5 million. Yeah, no, the 1 .5. day before, you just put in $3 million. So that's why these things are in place, is to protect investors from investors doing those, you know, from, from folks doing those kinds of things. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Control provisions are 
this is where people get in fights. Like who ha like, so you'll sit there and you'll be like, okay, if it's half and like, let's say there's a several investors and then two investors have to get together. I had, I did have a company here locally that, so an investor, a late stage investor came in company. They just had put in, um, they put in a $12 million. Okay. On a $60 million valuation. Okay. Um, and uh, we had all invested at very low single digit kind of valuations and someone offered us $80 million for the company. And frankly, all of us, including the founders were like, we should take this. But one of the terms in the, in this particular deal, we needed the approval of the latest investor, the $12 million investor and the $12 million investor would just get his money back because it was a high valuation. Um, and you know what the, that later investor said? He actually, interestingly, and we'll go to this in a second, he voted in favor of the deal as a board member. So this is in the best interest of all shareholders. And then he blocked the deal on behalf of his series C in that case, uh, invest, investment. He voted for the deal saying, I think it's in the best interest of all shareholders, but then he had a right to block it as a mem as a, so he, so that we had unanimous board approval deal didn't go through because he blocked it. So let's start. So that, so again, these are how these sort of things can play out. Does that make sense? So reading through understanding the control provisions, what does it mean? Who has right, who has a right to block what and when? really important as you're thinking about this. That's another really important term. Okay. So, Greg, I have a question since you brought it up because I was going to ask it, but you, you, you gave an example. I was going to ask, what is the role of a board if there is a board, if there's like an unanimous decision, if it's like protecting the interest of, you know, the investors and the founders, there could, could still be a control provision from one of the investors that like blocks everything. Like basically it's, it's a, the last step up, even if the board unanimously agree or disagrees on something. Yeah, the board, the board agreed that we, we all thought, including the investor who made the investment, that it was a great deal for everyone except for his small ownership. But he had a right to block, so he did. Yeah. By the way, we never got back to that valuation. We ended up selling it for like $40 million. Um, but many years later, but like, so, so shouldn't have, but anyway, that's the, that's the, yes. So there's two layers. And so what is number four here, Mateo, just cause you're on the, the hot seat here, even though Tessie wants to be, I, I can, she's like the next person in my little string of, of faces. Um, so The board is one layer of protection, um, but then another is these control provisions. It's a negative protection. It, it, it sort of allows you to sort of do things like block things. Okay, Tessie, here's your question. Is board membership a control provision or an economics provision? Control. Correct. What would be, as you think about, and then we can, I'm, I'm, we're, we're running low on time, so I won't keep going back to the term sheet, but maybe John will forward this around to people so that you can look at these terms, but there is a term called That'd board membership. So what would be, as you're thinking about a board as an investor, you know, typically you'll have a founder, an investor, and then you may have an independent so that the independent then has the ability to break ties, right? Oftentimes early on with angels, you might have two founders and an angel, so two founders and maybe one person from the angel investment syndicate on the board. Why am I okay with that, Tessie? Why might I be okay? Now, in this case, the founders have controls. They can do, 
they basically can really screw over the investors from a board perspective. But why am I probably okay with that? Because founders and early investors are more aligned. They're aligned. And what do we just talk about? We have these control provisions. So they can't, so for the most important things, we have our ability to, to make sure they don't, they, they don't. Go off the rails. Right. Yeah. So I'm usually, when we start companies, I'm okay, especially because over time, more and more VCs join. And then ultimately the common and the founders lose control. But early on, I actually am totally fine. And you should be fine with having the founders either have control of the board or certainly, you know, have an independent, you know, but like, I, I don't get too worked up as long as I have the control provisions sort of in decent enough shape, if that makes sense. So they kind of work in some ways hand in hand. Um, as a company keeps going on, then you want to have a board that is can be somewhat somewhat that where it's uh, uh, where you might have let's say you know a founder or two founders, maybe two investors, and then maybe one independent, or you might have you know founder, you know uh, one uh, VC for example, and then and then three independent. You know, so you're sort of thinking about how does this work because the board does have the ability to do to make important decisions like, should we sell the company? Like, how much should we fire the CEO? Like, you know, I mean, the key decisions the board has as important, they're not day-to-day -day decisions. They're more decisions. And, and the most important decision being, should we fire the CEO or should the CEO keep going? Now you're not, you know, again, having done this for many years, very rarely do you end up firing a CEO, but it does happen. I've had many cases where the CEO has, has committed fraud, has sexually harassed an employee, has done a bunch of things, and then you have to fire that person. It's the board that has to then fire the CEO, all right, um, and then find, you know, his or her replacement. Um, the... So it's, a, it's an making sure that that board is composed of the... Of, of, of folks that take that job seriously is really uh, is really important. Uh, any questions about that? Um, is it ever okay to just have a board of one? Um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think hopefully the board can be a real sounding board for that founding. Yes, early on in a company's life, very, very early, you can have a board of one. Because I think it's better to have a board of one than a board of nincompoops, right? So, so you, so and I just wanted to use that word. It sounded like a good word to use. So, so, um, so the, but over time, the board you want it to be comprised of hopefully people that that will really make you know good decisions on behalf of the company and hold the CEO, um, you know, accountable. Um, my view on board membership, and I would say this for everyone that's thinking about board work, is I feel like I, and I tell the CEOs, I basically work for the CEO as a board member until I decide that he or she should no longer be the CEO. I work for the CEO until I decide that the, you know, or the board decides that that person should be fired, all right? And so, you know, to me, it's like we as a, as a board are trying to do everything humanly possible to make that CEO successful until we decide that that CEO should no longer be in that seat, again, which is a very rare occasion. So as a board member, especially of an early stage company, I'm, you know, I'm, introducing them to investors, introducing them to customers, introducing them to new hire. I mean, anything I can do, you know, talking about strategy, thinking about, I mean, I'm basically a member of that extended team. I'm not day-to-day -day involved because I, I essentially feel like, in a sense, I report to the CEO almost, trying to help that person nail it. 
be as successful as possible. That's why when I'm doing terms, I want to be very aligned with the CEO because I want to try to make that CEO. I don't want to have terms. I hate having things where it's like tranched investment where like later on the money comes in because then I'm like rooting against the CEO. Well, wait a second. Like I want to be helping that CEO be as successful as possible. So I'm doing everything I can to be as helpful as I can until it might come to a point where that person, where then as a board, we decide that person's no longer, you know, should be in that seat. How often do you see CEOs on the board also? 100%. Yeah. Always. So they're one of the board members. And in fact, in any term sheet, it will typically say, that the CEO will be defined as being, if you go back and look at the, the term sheet, the annotated term sheet, it will have that. It'll say, you know, blah, 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 who, who is the CEO, will be a member of the board, who is the CEO or whatever. It'll have that as a defined term. Okay, let's- How often do you see other co-founders as board members? It depends how early. So early on in a company's life, more and then as a company continues to get more and more board members and, and matures, then, uh, then typically some of the founders will peel off. They may continue to be board observers, but being full board members as a company continues in its life, that may they may fall off over time. Thank you. But early on, very typical. It depends how many, and then you might have some of them are full board members and others are board observers, for example. Board observers don't have rights, but they have the right to sit and basically participate in the board meeting, do everything except vote on things like control provisions, right, or other things like that. Um, um, you know, or, you know, or not control provisions, but like you might have a, a, a something like, okay, should we, should this company be acquired? Should we do this or that? Should we fire the CEO? If you're a board observer, you don't get to participate in that vote. Um, founder vesting, final one. Um, is this a, what do you think? Is this a, Slava, is this a founder vesting, a economics term or a control term? Anyone? Um, I'm not even control sure. Term? Control term? It's a little bit of both, probably. This is one where it kind of mixes a teeny bit. What is founder vesting? Why do investors want it? Dan? Yeah, sorry. I'm looking to put the hand up icon. I can't find it on my Zoom update. Uh, in any case, I think it's to... Uh, uh, essentially obligate founders to stick around long enough to contribute to the growing value of the company. So, you know, founder can't quit the day after uh, investments raised and they still get to walk away with their whatever share they had, 70%, and leave the investors holding the bag. I wouldn't make an angel investment without sort of understanding what the founder vesting is for the same reason that Dan just said. Um, you know, you're, you're betting more actually in many ways in the founders and you are the idea itself. And so if the founders has no incentive to stick around um, in terms of vesting those shares over time, it doesn't make sense. Now, sometimes you'll give credit for, and the founder vesting is a term that you'll find in the annotated term sheets or typical. Typical, what a founder vesting schedule will look like is it'll be over four years, 25% over, you know, per year over four years. It may have a year cliff vesting. You know, for founders, I typically get rid of that cliff and just to be able to have it because, you know, and then I sometimes will give credit for time served. So for example, I've been working on this, I, this, I've been working on this idea for the last six months. So you might say, okay, instead of four years, we're going to give you credit for those, you know, we're going to invest you fully in that six months. And then, and then we're going to give you, you know, so it's just really three and a half years of vesting, or you might say, I'm going to give you full vesting of that, but I still want four years of vesting, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to forward, I'm going to basically have you fully vested in some percentage, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 25%, depending how long they've been at it. You want to give some recognition, some credit to that, right? This is especially important in where you have multiple founders. And I can't tell you how many times this has happened, but it's been a lot where, you know, when everything starts out, everything is great. And then one of the founders 
falls in love. One of the founders gets divorced. One of the founders, I just had this recently, dad passed away from COVID and something happens. And it's, it's like, you know, they, they, they don't, they just, they stop coming to the company. This is a founder. There's three founders in this case. They each, one founder had a little bit more because you don't want to have, sometimes you want to have at least one person with 1% so they can sort of break ties and stuff. In this case, it was 34, 33, 33 in terms of the founders. And one of the founders' father passed away from COVID. It's very sad. Um, but he mentally was gone and stopped coming to work, stopped being productive. The other two founders working 100 hours a week. They're like, wait a second. Like, this is our best friend. We love this person, but like, like, he hasn't been in the office for six months. Like, they gave him a couple months, but then, you know, then they, but, and so if they didn't have the founder vesting, um, I mean, I've seen it destroy companies, right? All of a sudden, they're like, this other founder has, you know, as much as I have, and I'm going to spend the next three years spending 100 hours a week. And, and so anyway, so it's smart to have some kind of vesting, some kind of, of, of thoughtful way to approach that, especially if you have multiple founders. And also as an angel investor to think about what is, you know, do you have the right vesting in place? Are you being fair? Are you being empathetic for the work that's been done? But are you being thoughtful then about creating the right kind of incentives? Okay, so those are the five terms. Let's just quickly, Michael, do you want to, without looking, do you want to go through that? Those are the only things the lawyers can take care of the rest. There's voting. There's other things that you might want to learn about. Those are, what were the five terms? Michael, you're on mute. Um, I, I couldn't recite them all. I was, I, I just went through this two months ago with, with trans world. And so I've been rolling two scenarios around. All right. Does anyone want to take it? Nick, do you want to take it again? Yeah, what were the five terms that you should care about? There's only five that I think you as a founder and angel investor should be very focused on other things like Registration rights, voting rights, drag along rights. Eh, not that they're unimportant. You just let the lawyers take care of that. What were the five that we talked about? Um, valuation. Yep. Liquidation preference. Yep. Control provisions, board membership, and vesting. Love it. I think if you focus on those terms, that's about 90% of the, I mean, of, you know, plus of the things that ever really, really matter at the end of the day. Those are the things, those are the really ones that really matter. So, so you, you um, and then there's all kinds of nuances, corner cases, registration rights. If you go public, like, like why, you know, like, right, who cares? Like, you know, anyway. That's it. Hopefully that was helpful <laughs> and gives you a little more familiar. But I think if you just remember those things, then um, you can kind of feel a little more confident because it's not like you have to know, I mean, you know, that's a pretty dense amount of legalese, but you don't need to know all that. There's a great book called Venture Deals, if this sort of really gets you excited by, and I helped to edit it. So that's probably, but I'm not, I have no, economic interest in it, <laughs> but, it uh, but it's by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson, two very good venture capitalists. Um, and, 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 uh, and then they go through each of these terms in, and including other ones in, in much more detail, talking about some of the same kinds of things. So if you're really fascinated by this, hopefully not, but if you are, <laughs> Venture Deals is the best, that's sort of the, the best book on this subject. I hope that helps. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. What would you say is the difference, like philosophically, like it seems like people either sort of become like more investors or more founders. Wouldn't you say that people tend to go in one direction, you have serial entrepreneurs and then serial investors? I, I think that, yes, I think you kind of have a something. Like what's that the difference between the two mentalities? Or well, two I think it's between being a builder, wanting to build things 
and more being someone that wants to help people build things, right? Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. turns out I was a venture capitalist for, you know, 15 years. And then I figured out what I really liked doing more was actually to build things. So, you know, it's not clear to me sometimes, I mean, it's really fun to invest in things and, and to be a part of it, but like even more fun, I think, to really get your hands a little bit dirty and really try to help to build something. And so that's why I really enjoy the studio stuff um, even more than I like the, the venture stuff, but I like both are, are fun, but the idea of being able to get your hands you know, the thing that gave me the most satisfaction in my you know, 20 plus years at Madrona was actually Rover, where I sort of got to start it and, and, and was the in initial CEO and, and, and then hired someone, but was very sort of much more involved. That gave me a lot more satisfaction than others that had still really nice financial returns, but I had less, much less. Um, I just felt like if I got hit by a truck, um, someone else could fill in for me equally, probably better. Uh, say smart things at board meetings and, you know, whereas if, um, if I felt like I could really participate in a more hands-on way, I just felt like it gave, gave, made me more excited to get up in the morning a little bit. But there are people that even sort of here at PSL, because we have Venture Fund and we have the studio, and there are some people that just, they just really love the investment side. They love doing what we just did. They love, you know, negotiate. They love competing for deals. Um, that really gets them going. And other people really want to be involved in sort of the, the, the building of stuff. So just, you know, I've always, it, it does fascinate me. Like I'm so, like I would do all this for free. I'd love it. I love being with you guys. I love, I just, I mean, it's just it's like, if you don't love this stuff, how can you love, this is like the most fun part about business. I mean, this is so fun. Are you kidding me? It's so fun. And I talked to my wife about it. She could care less. I talk about like, oh, like, you know, I've got this startup and what about this idea and that idea? And she looks at me like, and she's an attorney, um, you know, very, you know, smart, no interest, none. <laughs> you know, I don't know. We, uh, that's nice to have people that have different, so, yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts that people want to bring up? So I would I like do. to start, oh, go ahead, Dan. Um, yeah, I, I just, it's just time for another question around the terms. I mean, I was of the impression that a bunch of years ago, there was a big push to try to simplify and standardize terms and term sheets for early stage deals. And there was some, standard documents that were made available. And, and yeah. so I guess my question is, why is this still so complex after, you know, three plus decades of, of doing this, you know, of, of, of VC? There are standard documents. Th these are kind of like the same. It's the same. They're, it, it's just using the same terms, the annotated terms. The reason is, is because it's complex. People are complex. We just talked about the founder issues. You can't simplify you can't simplify that. Someone's got to make a call. You can't simplify things like, you know, are you going to have um, participating or, or not? You can't simplify. I mean, it's just because there's, you know, there are just different, these terms you can kind of play around with them. And, and yes, there are standard things. Y Combinator has a standard set of document and, and, and most people use those, but the, but the deal is, uh, the deal is really the devil's in the details, you know? And so, um, but that's why you know, most deals get done now with these convertible notes. All the things we talk about aren't relevant in a convertible note. It just is going to convert into that round. So early days, you don't really, you know, when you're just raising a million bucks, you don't really need to worry about this too much. You just set the value and then you push this off for another day. So I want to dive into that value thing because sometimes uh, – uh, we have different opinions about what the value means. Uh, Alliance of Angels thinks that the cap is the value. Um, I think that the valuation that we put on the cap is the valuation we're expecting when they take their next round. And there's a time difference in there. How do you approach the notion of what does value really mean? What's a valuation really mean in your cap on your convertible note? Oh, I... Yeah, I usually feel like it should be lower than what you expect the value to be because there should be some incentive to invest early. So I like to give, and I tell this to, to people starting businesses. I told this to my best friend. 
you just had a, you know, had a business. I'm like, you know, you want to screw over your friends and family? Is that what you're about? It's like, no, you want to like, if people are going to bet on you early, they should get a reward for that. Someone's going to take a chance on you because that's what it is. Two thirds of venture backed startups fail, don't return capital. This is not, this isn't, this is hard stuff. Most things don't return capital. Even venture backed companies from top firms, most companies do not return capital. So this is high risk. So, you know, do I think that, that, that for a cap, you should, there should be some benefit for investing early? Yes, I do. And how much that should be, you know, is a, I mean, so typically I would want the cap to be, you know, 60%, I mean, obviously that you're gonna get 20% discount, so it should be even better than the 20% discount. So maybe it's a, maybe it's a 50% discount or a 40% discount or something like that would be sort of perfectly situated, but that's how I would think about it. So if we think of this as a 10X company that's uh, growing 10X a year in the early years, um, to get a 20% discount is like nothing because it's changed by in that year that we waited for that fund, it's become 10 times more valuable. Yeah, that's why, that's why people stopped doing, that's why people didn't like those notes. So that's what, why they came up with this idea of a cap. And, right. and I feel like, especially if you're going out to friends and family, you, know, you want to give them a great deal because they deserve it for betting on you early. Um, yeah. So yeah. people are saying that there's not a lot of uh, um, activity in the early stage funding in Seattle. And I'm not quite sure why I'm getting that thing you want to say anything about what you think the current state of angel investing is in seattle i think it's i mean i think it's been you know historically over the last couple of years i think it's been pretty good um the economy is shit you know um and so people are scared venture capital firms are scared people are protecting you know and that's why it's probably a great time to invest but it's hard to invest because you you're you you know you just watched all your stocks go down by 90% or if you're in tech or like by 70% or you're seeing things like Amazon trading at like, you know, where the e-commerce business is essentially trading, you know, at zero. And you're like, wow, there are great other places to put my money now. So why would I? And so um, I do think, you know, like it will be a, pro I think there is a slowdown in some investing because the economy is, is, is down. Um, but now is typically when great companies, you know, get formed. And then I just think, you know, I don't, I never think that angel investing should be a meaningful part of anyone's portfolio, but I think you should try to stay consistent and try over time. If you're going to do angel bets, make smaller bets, make more of them and be consistent. So you catch all the different kinds of of cycles, right? So you just are like, hey, I'm going to, I feel like I want to make an angel bet or two per year. I'm going to do that for the next five years. I'm going to build a portfolio of 15 companies. If, that, if that's what you want to do, that's better than saying, I'm going to, you know, put all my eggs in one basket when I know that two thirds of venture back startups fail, right? So I, I like the idea of sort of, of just trying to have some, you know, consistency, Make sure it's a small part of your portfolio. Make sure it's it's limited. Bet on people. The way I like to think about it, John, who do you know, John, that if they came to you and said, I'm starting a company, who do you know? Now, without hearing another word, you reach into your pocket, pull out a checkbook, write a $20,000, $25,000 check, hand it across the table and say, what's the idea? Like that's, that's great angel investing. It's not falling in love with an idea that'll like the, my biggest regrets for investing is, 100% around investing in ideas that I love because I think to myself, gosh, that's a great idea. I could do great things with that idea. I could make that actually work. And of course, then it's not me that's running the company, right? Um, the, the, the deals that I never regret is when I bet on a great founder, they're going after a big idea and it doesn't work, but I know they gave it 110%. Um, so I, I just think focus on founders that you love, um, you know, and support them, try to make them successful. That's the, that's great angel investing. Yep, absolutely. And did you have a question there? Oh, I just had a question about a, the, the safe note concept. Can someone, can, after someone has held a safe note for a year, mm -hmm. 
they can either convert or call it, right? Depends on the terms. Um, right. you know, most of the time, no. What happens? Because that's a lot of debt, you know, conceivably. Yeah. Most of the time, the company won't have money. So you could convert, you could say, I want my money back. It's called redemption, or you might, or maybe the term of the note, if, whether it's a safe or a note, it might have a term on it. And then you say, gosh, you know, that's a safe. It's a million dollars we put in this company. Okay, time's up. Give us our money back. The company says, we don't have the money. We spent it. Right. So, yeah, that doesn't, yeah. So uh, I don't think that, you know, same with redemption on some of these things. So typically most term sheets have no redemption because it's, it doesn't mean anything. And do you just I, have them keep paying um, interest or do you keep paying interest then if they don't convert? I think that's a risk that you take. So even if they, even if you, you may have an interest feature, you may not. Um, but to me, that's not a way to make money. If a company can't afford to pay you, it doesn't have any hopes of raising additional capital. You're kind of that you're going to lose all your money. So the reason that I like a convertible note with a term and uh, some some notion, even though Greg is entirely right, they don't have the million dollars is I have the ability to pull them to the table and have a conversation and negotiate what we're gonna do next. And when we have a safe with no term, then there's no hook. There's no way the to- The value of a convertible note traditionally over a safe, and I'm indifferent really, because is theoretically a convertible note sometimes has a security agreement at attached to it. So you might have a security interest in the intellectual property or something else associated with the company. Right, so safes tend not to have that. Convertible notes is actual debt versus safe is like a kind of a contract effectively. Whereas a, a note is actual debt and then the debt can be secured by the intellectual property of the business. Um, but realistically, the intellectual property of a business that can't raise money and is run it isn't like, what's that worth? So, I mean, yes. Better, no question, better legally, but not, I mean, like I haven't seen, again, in doing this for 25 years, if a company runs out of money, I, you know, uh, it's very rare that the intellectual property is worth anything, worth, you know, no, you know, it's going to be worth pennies on the dollar at, at best if the people aren't going to kind of go with it. So yes, it's better, but it's not, yeah. So there's a guy in Austin named Hall Martin that has this three by three notion that in year three, he'll decide whether you're a go big company or a not go big company. And then he'll either take a revenue redemption out of the company or he'll um, double down on the secured um, preferred stock. So there's, there's a bunch of different alternatives out there um, more than just the safe. Um, and, you know, we have Calm Fund, which is also doing a, revenue redemption model of their very own kind called the SEAL. So we have lots of choices. Mateo, I see your hand up. Yeah, you just actually mentioned, and I know John, you're not a big fan, but during our, um, during the first the transatlantic conference, we did discuss briefly about the um, revenue sharing agreement, uh, the SEAL. So I'm curious, Greg, if you have any thoughts on that, what is your, what is your position or perspective on those type of agreements? Yeah, I've actually seen them, you know, I was, I was down on them. I have a company that did it and it can work. I just, I don't know, for the vast majority of companies, it doesn't work super well because early stage companies, very hard to figure out if they're going to hit their, their plan. Better for companies that actually have real revenue and sustainable revenue, then I think it can make sense. Um, so long as you're not selling the company and so long as they don't have a bunch of claws in you that you can't. The only thing I would say about those revenue sharing agreements is just make sure that you there's a way out of them because I think they do tend to halt you from being able to sell the company or do other things like that. So, um, so long as they're structured in a way that you can, you can relieve yourself of them, they can make sense. They can be a way to sort of not take on, you know, a whole bunch of, of dilution. Um, sometimes they have warrants, other things attached to them. Um, significant warrants. And so I just would, you know, I would compare it to other options you have, but it, it is, you know, it is one option of many options to consider when you're financing. 
Thanks. And for and most, other- most companies that I work with, it makes doesn't make sense. But for some, we have one that it actually works quite well for because it has a company which just has consistent revenue and they've been able to use that effectively. But, it, but you know, yeah. But I'm generally, I generally want to make sure that's something where I like actually read the documents pretty carefully and really try to game plan out what would happen under what scenarios. I'm going to take my children who are somehow came to work with me home here. Is there any other questions? So my email is greg at psl.com. Um, think pumpkin spice latte, um, if you forget. <laughs> and um, Lighter Capital is a good company. Um, Melissa's great. Um, that's, they do revenue loans for certain kinds of companies. Um, and uh, Greg at, uh, at um, psl.com. Happy to answer any questions. And it's really been a pleasure to spend the evening with you guys. It was wonderful. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Thanks John. Nice. Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you Greg. so much. Thanks. Hey, John, I'll send Thank you, you, I'll, you, send so you I'll send you um, the annotated term sheet um, okay. so people can forward it around. I yeah, think that'd be great. I'll, I'll mail it out to everybody who attended. Great. Um, it's the Wilson Sonsini one from, from years from years ago. But I, again, it does a nice job of just talking about the terms. Um, please don't spend too much time on it. Um, um, because, you know, but hopefully now next time you're doing a deal and someone says pre-money or post-money this or, you know, or what's the liquid, you, you'll be like, oh, hey, yeah, that's I, that's important. I want to understand that. Hopefully you got that out of it tonight. So, yeah. okay. Thanks, Absolutely. everybody. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you.